Thank you for joining us today in person and online for a sober and urgently needed discussion of online safety. I say urgent because we now clearly know two things. First, unregulated digital platforms result in real world physical and mental harms and pose an existential threat to our democracy. And second, there are steps that we can take right now to stop or mitigate those dangers. And if we know there's a problem and we know how to fix it, any delay means needless hurt for our kids, our families, our communities. I wanna start by looking to another technological revolution that changed how we lived. Cars were first produced in the late 19th century with the 1908 Model T first putting them in reach of average Americans. They brought newfound freedom and speed, leaving 1,500 pounds of machine in the hands of each driver and the fatalities to match. Early safety efforts were primarily focused on improving driver behavior. To quote the Smithsonian Institute, the automobile was perceived as a neutral device that merely responded to a driver's commands and could not cause an accident. Manufacturers dragged their heels in acknowledging that the designs of the cars themselves affected their safety. Seat belts, padded dashboards, and energy absorbing steering columns had actually been invented in the 1930s. But they weren't added for several decades until universities studied how collisions affected a car's occupants. And that was possible because cars could be easily studied and weren't hid from scrutiny behind corporate walls. It was only then in 1961 that elected officials began passing seatbelt laws, and in 1968 when Congress finally called for the federal government to impose safety standards. Between 1908 and 1968, when seatbelts became mandatory, more than one and a half million people were killed in car accidents, with the number of fatalities per capita dropping steadily after that. Now let's jump back to today to hear how history rhymes. As online services grow, grew, their purveyors loudly asserted they must be left unregulated to innovate. Changes to the services models were never really contemplated. After all, the technology was simply seen as a neutral tool. If there were harms that arose, it must have been entirely the user's fault. In other words, focus on the bullies, not their digital megaphones. But now something has changed. We are starting to see research, in some cases leaked directly from the tech companies themselves, that social media is hurting people. There is no such thing as digital harm. Digital tools harm people in the real world physically and mentally, particularly our kids, and especially our most vulnerable children who are already victims of political targeting. We are also starting to learn how tech companies choose to maximize user engagement at any cost, even their users' well being, with real world life and death consequences. This has led to polarization and division among us as some exploit these platforms to destabilize the cornerstones of our democracies. We experienced it two years ago with the attack on our capital, and now we've seen it again in Brazil just several weeks ago. But this is likely just the start. And now a big part of the closest thing we have had to an online public space is under the control of one man, his cosmic ego, and his puerile whims. CAP joined with 13 other organizations to sound the alarm when Musk suspended the accounts of journalists and let back on those who had incited hate-fueled violence. Now Twitter has erected a new barrier to transparency and accountability, announcing that access to its APIs will no longer be free, and forcing everyone, including researchers, to pay to access its data. So the need for action is clear. Digital platforms are profiting from the harms they cause, and fighting digital abuses must be a societal concern for everyone here in the U.S. and around the globe. Have the seat, seat belts been invented yet? That is, do we know how to tackle this problem? And I would contend that we do, and we can look to Europe to begin that conversation. This month, the EU's Landmark Digital Services Act, or DSA, begins to go into effect. And our first discussion today will explore the new law and what it's likely to accomplish. Coming out of that conversation, I suspect you will wonder, as I do, why American tech companies will be offering better protections to Europeans than their fellow Americans. Our second discussion will be between CAP President Patrick Gaspard and FTC Commissioner Alvaro Bedoya, who will focus specifically on safety for kids and families online and what we can do to improve it here in America. So with that, let me introduce our first panel. 
we're delighted to welcome the Honorable Sandro Gozzi, who is an authoritative source on the DSA and one of its chief proponents and architects within the European Parliament. He is also the European Parliament's rapporteur for regulating the transparency and targeting of political advertising and was elected president of the Union of European Federalists in 2018. His career is long and distinguished, having previously served as Italian Secretary of State for European Affairs and in the cabinet of the European Commission President. He also had been elected Vice President of the Assembly of the Council of Europe. We are grateful for him to have traveled so far for today's discussion. In conversation with Sandro will be my exceptional colleague, Leticia Evia, one of CAP's newest senior fellows and a leading voice for online safety. Leticia was most recently a member of the French Parliament, where she drafted and successfully passed hate speech legislation. Uh, we are incredibly lucky to have her leadership on these issues at CAB. Uh, those of you in the audience and online will have the opportunity to pose questions to both of our panels at the end of their remarks. Now let me turn it over to Leticia and Sandra. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone in the room and people online. Thank you, Ben, for your kind words. And thank you, Sandro, to come here at CAP for this discussion that is so important today for Safer Internet Day. So I'm um, Leticia Avia. I'm a new senior fellow here at CAP, and I was a member of the French Parliament for the last five years. And during this time, I worked on fighting online hate speech. And the question that people ask me a lot of time is, why did I decide to work on this subject? And there is a short and true answer to that. It's because I experienced hate online as a woman, as a black woman, as a politician. I could see every day how social media can be used to silence people and not silence people because of what they say or what they think, but what they are. And so I decided I would not just suffer from it, but take action. And I could see that in Europe, in Germany, a first law had passed at that time. And this law made tech companies accountable up to 50 million euros if they didn't take action against online hate. So that's where we decided we will continue this work in France. It wasn't that easy. We had to pass two different laws so we could uh, tackle online hate speech because there is this very important, and I know here also, discussion about freedom of speech. What is the balance between freedom of speech and the necessity to protect users on the internet? That's why we had a lot of debates. But at the end of the day, we all came with the same goal, the goal was to ensure safety on the internet. Maybe people didn't agree on all the means to, to, to make that happen, but we had the same goal. Also because we had some national events which united people around this subject. We had this terrible uh, terrorist at uh, attack towards uh, Samuel Paty. And that's a time where everyone realized that social media played a big part in this terrorist attack. And then we had growing numbers of kids committing suicidal after cyberbullying. I didn't wanna put this conversation in a dark place, but I thought it was very important to remind, to, to remember, uh, to remind everyone that there is no such thing as digital harm. There are real people um, behind the screen. And there are real people suffering. And this is why this day and this discussion are very important. And now I come to you, Sandra, because as I said, it wasn't that easy to find a consensus in France. And you made an incredible work in Europe with 27 countries, 27 ways to approach freedom of speech, 27 ways to define what is racism, what is disinformation. And you find the solution in a couple of months. How did that go? Uh, <clears throat> I've been very lucky. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you to the Center for American Progress. And I'm very delighted uh, to see uh, again my colleague and friend, Leticia Via. Uh, she's too shy because uh, she has 
contributed a lot to the to shape the agreement at European level. She has been one of the key actors, but uh, I mean, uh, uh, she, she she hasn't said it. Um, yes, it was difficult, but uh, uh, it was uh, um, we 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 uh, managed to persuade both the member of the European Parliament and the member of the, and the government in the Council. Uh, about one very uh, simple uh, message. Uh, the European Union was the only level that could be effective in tackle the big power that represent today the major digital platform. So the main message is, it was either we, we do it so on the basic principles, of, either we do it at European level or we won't do it because uh, uh, yes, there have been some good advancement at national level, but uh, you do not uh, find, do not have the regulatory power at national level to really impose uh, uh, good rules uh, to the platform. So that that was the main message. And as every, uh, from different perspective, most of the government uh, have experienced experienced problems in dealing, be it uh, for unfair trade practices, be it for a speech, be it uh, for, I mean, aid uh, campaign, uh, all, the, all, the, <clears throat> all the European state have faced uh, major problems in dealing with uh, the, uh, the big platform, the gatekeepers. Uh, so that was the main message. Uh, uh, the second is that we have really to start from scratch and to rethink all the tools that we have uh, to intervene in the market. So, I mean, there were some conservatives which were saying, but after all, we can use the existing antitrust uh, rules that we have to ensure that uh, the market is really a plural market. It's not uh, totally controlled or 90% controlled by three or four gatekeepers. That was, uh, we managed to persuade that you can, you can, there is a certain, you can do what you already have at a certain extent, but in this new world, in this new market, which is the digital market, you have also to invent new regulatory, regulatory tools. And this is why from the market approach, we haven't relied only on the competition tools. We have created a new single market tools, which is uh, the Digital Market Act to uh, organize in a more plural and most effective, more effective way, the, the, the way the, the market functions. Then uh, we had also look at the services. And that it has been extremely, extremely intensive work because the digital service sector on which we, are, we will uh, dwell today, uh, it is uh, a, 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 a combination of very different issues and very different response. Uh, response to unfair trade practice, a response to uh, the need for new risk assessment, a response to how you balance uh, freedom of speech, and I say freedom of reach, because one of the main messages that we have uh, conveyed with the digital service sect that we don't want to restrain the freedom of expression of everybody or anybody. But one, 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 issue, one, uh, one issue is uh, the freedom of uh, expression, freedom of speech. The other is to have the right to get viral every time you deny that Holocaust happened. On that, I might have some problem. Huh? So, I mean, th and that is a gray zone, huh? and we will talk about that. But that's what we decided to do. Uh, we decided to impose to the platform this kind of obligation. And then, but we will come back on this. And then the issue, the fact that uh, uh, Europe, the European Union is based on two main, uh, main pillars. And it will be my last word. The first is uh, it's an union of uh, rule of law and fundamental uh, values. And uh, we needed to ensure the respect of this, of rule of law and fundamental values also in the Far West, as we call it. Because we say the times to um, call a sheriff in the Far West. The Far West is the digital world before the digital service act. The, the, the sheriff is the digital service act. 
Um, and on the other side, that we are based on a single market and without good market and regulatory tools, you cannot have a properly functioning European single market. These are the two reasons that I, we use to persuade uh, the, the state to move ahead with these uh, two pieces of legislation. And we are continuing because as it has been recalled, we are now, we just adopted in the parliament, I was a draftsman, a new regulation on political advertising, which is a spin-off of the digital service sector. So if we if we focus on the Digital Services Act, I think you you put one of the major elements is that some people, especially the tech companies, will not want to apply this regulation. They will say it's about censoring people. It's about uh, restriction to the freedom of speech. And when you look at the Digital Services Act, you look you read it completely. You will never see any provision that is about that. This is a regulation that is about safety. That is a regulation that is about uh, fundamental rights and rights of the users. And you will never see a single word about um, limitation uh, of uh, the freedom of speech. So if we could just come to the principles that governs the Digital Services Act, if you had just to explain them very uh, simply, what are the two or three main principles and rules that governs uh, Digital Services Act, which are the ones you will pick? Yeah, first of all, it is uh, uh, it's true. I mean, of course, uh, the, the the main uh, platform, the gatekeepers, uh, try to, uh, at the beginning, uh, to accuse us uh, uh, of a will of rest, uh, having a restrictive approach, restricting the market, uh, 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 I mean, uh, um, reducing uh, the market uh, possibility, reducing the rights, etc. But it is not absolutely not this. It is uh, the issue is uh, we want to make uh, the uh, digital world safer and fairer. Uh, and it is clear that to make it safer and fairer, you need to intervene because we will come back on that. Self-regulation is not enough. Can help. Can help, especially when it's transparent. But it's not enough. Uh, so, I mean, uh, first of all, we set, uh, we uh, um, we uh, enshrined a very common sense, uh, sensible uh, principle. What is illegal offline must become illegal online. That's the fundamental principles of the digital service sector. And of course, this applies to the, the several activities that uh, are encompassed in the digital service sector. The first one is the measure to counter illegal goods, services or content online. So we introduced new, new mechanisms uh, to help to, to uh, fight against uh, counterfeited products, illegal products, illegal. So for example, a mechanism for users to easily flag in illegal content and for platform to uh, cooperate with the so-called trusted flaggers. And we, invented a new legal notion of trusted flaggers, personalities identified that are entrusted to uh, flag out the risk that something is not going as it should be. Something is illegal, something is, is happening is wrong on the, uh, in, the, in, the digital, in the digital market. We have introduced uh, from the commercial side because there is a, a, a relevant commercial dimension in the digital service sector, of course, uh, new obligation on traceability of business users in the in online marketplaces, and all this these two uh, these two uh, innovation uh, respond to the two uh, needs that I was telling you: safer and more transparent uh, digital dig digital market. We have introduced new measure to empower uh, user and civil society uh, in uh, contributing in making the, the digital market and digital world safer and fairer. For example, the possibility to, to challenge platforms, content moderation, moderation decisions, to seek redress. And you can seek redress, uh, you got two, two, uh, it's a two track, uh, you got two options to, to, to seek redress, either uh, via, via an out of court dispute mechanism or through judicial redress. Of course, the first one is quicker, but you got an option. Uh, you got uh, provisions of access of vetted researchers to the key data 
of the largest platform and provision to access uh, to NGO as regards public data and to provide more insight into how online risk evolve. So, uh, and we will, uh, we open the black box, as I always say. We open the algorithm and we, we give the possibility, of course, not to everybody, because you got also uh, the issue of trademarks, the issue of, of uh, secret commercial secrets, but to uh, recognize the entrusted personality, you got, the, you got the possibility of going into the algorithms and see how it works. And then you have uh, two measures to assess and mitigate risks. Uh, for example, the obligation for very large on online platforms to take risk-based action to prevent the misuse of their systems and undergo independent audits of their risk management system. So each platform opted, opts for which kind of risk management uh, system it won't introduce, but uh, there is also an external evaluation through independent audit. And the very large online platform are uh, asked to report every six months about uh, how uh, the system is working, how effective have been the measure that they've taken to, for the risk assessment. We have introduced many mechanisms to adopt swiftly, uh, swiftly and uh, to adapt swiftly and efficiently in reaction to crises affecting public security or public health, because we, we don't want to leave what we have left uh, during the COVID crisis. Where obviously fake and very dangerous for the public health information were spread around, not only by private actors, but also by, by external actors. If we make the time, we talk about foreign interference. But I mean, if you look at what China did during the COVID crisis, also through the digital platform in Europe, you understand that we need to introduce uh, this new uh, mechanism and safeguard. And then new safeguard for the protection, protection of minors and limits on the use of sensitive personal data for targeted advertising. We ban that. We don't allow to do micro-targeting to child, to minors, because we think that they are not uh, aware enough to handle that, whereas an average consumer can handle that. So that, that is the distinction that we, may, we made, and, and I think that uh, this is uh, already something we would like to this see. Is this in other parts of the world. Sure, sure. This is, and these are very critical, significant, major measures. And I think when it comes to content regulation and the way we approach uh, those contents that are uh, harming people, I often say that it's, it's not a heavy regulation because all the tech companies, they have the possibility to adapt to the way they function. And, but they have a duty of care they have the obligation to be transparent and they are accountable. That's really the pillars of this regulation. And this duty of care, I like to use a comparison with a cake recipe because I like to cook. And I often say, we, the regulation, when I say we, we give the main ingredient for making a good cake. You can use, you can dose, you can, uh, use uh, the amount of each agreement you want. You can add the agreement you want. The cake better be good. If the cake is bad, then the transparency uh, um, provision uh, comes into application because the regulation will ask you to give exactly your recipe and to see what didn't work. And that will make you accountable. Accountable because when we talk about Tech companies, there is, there is one thing which work, that is money. Money talks a lot. So accountability for the European regulation, it's up to 6% of the global income. That's a lot. And that helps to cook a very good cake, I believe. And I wanted to jump into a subject that people have been talking a lot the couple of, last couple of months. And I think it's tweet, Twitter. And I think Twitter really helped you to bring this conversation into the public debate because everyone is aware of what is happening now. Everyone is a bit worried about these abuses. And the way that the policy of this platform could change depending on what Elon Musk will have for breakfast, it really raised the concern about which kind of policy do we want for the social media which are uh, governing the way millions of people communicate and get informed. So this 
gives you, um, I think, a good idea of what a regulation could do to bring more stability. So I made some notes for me because I, I, I try to, to remember the most significant changes that Enormous brought. And maybe we could just think about how the GSA would have an impact on that. So if we, we, we remember when Elon Musk came, uh, took over Twitter, first thing he did is that he fired the trust and safety team. Then he changed the policy to allow disinformation. Then he reopened the account of uh, suspended account, like neo-Nazi account. And then he suspended the accounts of journalists. Then some people were, um, let's say, challenging his ideas were shadow banned. And the last information that comes from last week is that now people conducting research on the API will have to pay to do their job. So if we take those elements, will the GSA change anything to the way uh, Elon Musk is governing Twitter today? Change a lot. Change a lot because DSA, as I mentioned, I, I was pretty specific in giving you, I mean, some the may, best example of, of the innovation. But uh, DSA is the end to uh, total self regulation and total self governance. And uh, it is uh, the, the law which introduces some binding principles, some binding objectives around which uh, the platform must organize their work. So it is clear that, uh, but we have been very clear at, at all level, not only myself, but I mean, my great Vestaya, Thierry Breton, several members of the European Commission has made clear also, I mean, recently uh, the French uh, Secretary of State, uh, Jean-Noël Barrault has met uh, Elon Musk. We have made, made clear uh, what you are doing will not be possible with the enforcement of DSA. Because you don't, you are not totally autonomous in regulating the way your business is run. You have some obligation that you have to fulfill, that you comply with. And uh, uh, for the, the, all the, uh, uh, the risk assessment and moderation, what I call the gray zone, huh? because there are not necessarily illegal activities, but there are activities potentially harmful. Huh? On, on, on this, he will have uh, to report every six months. He will have to accept that uh, we, uh, we all independent audit authorities, assess the effectiveness if something goes wrong on in the uh, on, on internet on, on Twitter. Uh, he will have uh, to take uh, the measures uh, to uh, redress the situation, and he will have to accept that this measure to redress the situation are evaluated, assessed through an independent audit, and he will have to report or every six months. He will have to accept that uh, academic researchers or a member of uh, uh, the supervisory authorities uh, accede ac and uh, look into the algorithm and look how it, how, why something went so wrong. So, uh, and, uh, and uh, it, it is clear also that uh, there are uh, users' rights uh, that he will have, he will have to respect all the all the users' rights that I mentioned that I mentioned in my first uh, in my first answer, and it is not uh, toothless this regulation, because in the case uh, of Twitter, clearly it will be the European Commission directly, which will have to supervise and to enforce the rules, uh, and it will have to sanction and fine if Elon Musk. Uh, in this case, because you asked about Elon Musk, we are not obsessed with him. But I mean, she she asked me she asked me to apply our rules to the Elon Musk Twitter case huh? without without being obsessed, concerned. Yes, very concerned as you are. Uh, there will be very heavy sanctions directly directly imposed by the European Commission. Of course, I mean this is what then as I, as I was saying to Ben uh, preparing this debate, uh, we will see in one year. Let's, let's organize this debate in one year, one year and a half time again, because it's only after 12, 18 months of enforcement that uh, 
we will know if uh, our effort has been effective. And but it is certainly necessary to go toward the direction. You know, Sandro, I'm not obsessed, but <laughs> I, I I found like three provisions that I thought, oh, that will talk to Elon Musk. Like Article 14, providers shall act in diligent, objective, and proportionate matter in applying and enforcing policies with due regard to right and legitimate interest of all parties, including freedom of expression and freedom of the media. I think that will talk. I think Article 70, Providers should provide a clear and specific statement of reason for any restriction imposed on a user. That will talk. And the last one, my favorite one, Article 41. Providers shall establish a compliance function with sufficient authority and resources. That is for firing all the trust and safety team. I'm not obsessed, but I just think that they will need, as Elon Musk himself said, that he will apply the DSA. And he said that to European commissioner, he said that to the French president, he said that to the digital minister president, that a lot is going to change for Twitter in Europe, but not here. And it's an American company that will just work in a way to make things safer for Europeans and not for us. Fellow citizens. Yeah, this is, so this is a very interesting, uh, uh, interesting aspect, because uh, I mean, uh, we are talking about the two biggest markets in the world, huh? our market and yours, and uh, you got major actors, most of them U.S. based, principally U.S. based actors, that are going to make a necessary effort to adapt to our new rules, to adapt to the new rules on the market, on the services, in a moment to the political advertising, etc. And that will require investment. They will have to hire people because, I mean, also, we haven't said it, that uh, uh, another, another, another issue, Leticia, which is very important, is that uh, we, for us, the moderate, the moderation must, that must be done in 27 languages, not only in English. Because if you make an effort to improve your moderation and your risk, risk assessment capacity only through English speaking uh, people, if something wrong happens in Germany, in Romania, in Italy, in Spain, it is clear that you don't have enough resources to intervene. And we insisted on that too. Uh, so you understand that there are Twitter, but also other major actors, US based, that are going to hire people. Uh, change the structure of their internal organization, spending money, because you need to spend money to adapt to uh, for win one of the market. And then they will follow a totally different structure and organization in the other biggest market in the world, which is the US market. And to me, this in the medium and long run doesn't doesn't make really sense. And to me, in the medium and long run, I see that there is an opportunity to start, maybe with child, maybe with minors, maybe with the most vulnerable groups. But there is a possibility. And there is a chance also in this side of the Atlantic to start to tackle certain issues. And the, the, uh, the, the, the interesting thing is that you will not tell them anything new. They will know perfectly what we are talking about, because when they take the plane and they cross the Atlantic, they arrive in Paris or in okay, Brussels, it is exactly the world they know and they live in and they work in. And I think that we do very good business in, by the way. Thank you, Sandro. Um, maybe just the last word before taking the question from the audience. Um, has been said in... Uh, the introductory uh, remarks. It is also a question about democracy and that is very important. It's not just a, a discussion, a debate we have about tech companies, tech possibilities or not. It's also the impact they have on our democracy. And I think it's important to, to address it because all the abuses we see now, they are threats to democracy 
when we talk about uh, disinformation is manipulations of people's minds. When we talk about the problem of the uh, uh, algorithm bubbles, it's also an attempt to a pluralism of ideas and to the openness of people. When we talk about online violence, polarizations, it is also affecting the political debate and uh, the possibility for people to uh, criticize uh, uh, in a peaceful way. And all of those are every day's uh, threats to uh, democracy. So um, acting also for a safer internet is uh, safe, it's, it's to, to be safer for people, for their mental health, for their physical health, but it's also for the values of the democracy. And I can see you, you started to talk a bit about that, that the European uh, Union wants to go a bit further against than that, and especially on the question of uh, financing of uh, all these uh, abuses. Yeah, um, that is uh, the next chapter, <laughs> the, next, uh, the, the next episode uh, of our effort uh, of uh, improving uh, the regulation. As I said, I mean, we have done, we have reorganized uh, the market with the Digital Market Act. We have uh, reorganized the way the services, I mean, uh, with an, a large notion, huh? commercial services, but also, I mean, uh, the, the way the platform function through the digital service sector. We are, stand, we are starting also, we have started also to organize the way the data, are, uh, the governance data. I mean, I've been also very much active in the data governance sector, which has been the first piece of legislation we adopted before this. And now, and now we are developing, we are using the digital service sector is, uh, for the lawyers who are present, it's a sort of lex generalis, it's a horizontal law. Huh? It's, it's a, the fundamental laws of digital services. And on this basis, we are inserting new piece of sectoral legislation. And the, the uh, bill that has just been, uh, has just been adopted uh, last week uh, in, the, in the parliament for which I was uh, the draftsman, I was a responsible member of the European parliament, and that now we are negotiating with the states is the new regulation on political advertising, which is based on digital service sector but introduce further innovation to what we have already foreseen through the digital service sector for the commercial advertising. Digital service sector is, I mean, general information and commercial advertising. But when it comes to political advertising, we think that we needed to do three things. The first thing is increasing the transparency. Also because of the recent scandal, I mean, the Qatar gate, I mean, there is a strong demand in Europe, for a, a more transparent, for more transparent political activities, and political advertising, notably uh, online, must become more transparent. So we want to know who does what and who pays what, uh, who pays for whom. So what we have, uh, we have introduced new obligation, trans uh, new transparency obligation. When it, it comes to a service of political advertising, of course, the, the, the new bill applies to services, remunerated services of political advertising, not to the, the, the free expression that each of us can, of course, uh, have on that. But when it, it is a, a remunerated service of political advertising, uh, you need, as a, you must, as a user, clearly know that uh, there is Sandro Godi, who is a candidate to the European Parliament. Uh, there is a, a sponsor, which is Leticia Via, which has given me 500,000 euro for the campaign. There is a service provider, which is Ben, which is doing the, the work of the service provider for me, candidate, uh, through the sponsorship. When you uh, you received a post, which I say, I mean, that uh, the way God received the word is uh, wonderful, uh, you, you must know that this is political advertising, that this is a campaign, that is a campaign. Uh, be paid by someone so everything we don't we don't uh, we don't uh, uh, forbid uh, ban uh, forbid anything but we want to make everything concerning political advertising fully transparent not the first second we want to respond to the stronger strong foreign interference and disinformation so for so I mean, we have uh, we have introduced new rules to protect from foreign interference, we, we, it is not possible for a non-EU actors 
to, 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 to sponsor political advertising during the referendum, during the electoral campaign. And we have introduced new rules on the personal data that you can use. So basically, with our, with our political advertising, if my bill huh, arrives to an end as it stands, we will negotiate with the, with, the, with the state, infer data and observe data cannot be used for political advertising. Uh, you, uh, you can use this data on which you provide consent, but of course, you are expert here. Infer data, observe data, they are not under consent and you cannot use them for political advertising. This is, of course, if I, I was a journalist, I need to write a title. The, the headline would be the European answer to the Cambridge Analytica scandal. 87 billion million personal data inferred, observed, used without consent of the people to which those data be, be, belong. And this, it is the new frontier uh, of our effort, of course, I have to negotiate with the state, but I'm confident that on the three pillars also, we will make a very good progress. Thank you, Sandro. If I were a journalist, I would write, um, European regulation has to empower people because knowledge is key, knowledge is power, transparency is power, and all this regulation, how about making people aware of what is happening on the tool they have every day, maybe 20, 20 hours a day in their hands and to know how it is using their data, how it is using uh, their information to abuse people sometimes and to abuse the system. Um, we'll just go for a short route, uh, round of questions. If uh, some, someone has some question to ask here or online. Yeah, I think we have time, I think, for one question. Um, oh, here. please say your name, your affiliation, and I try to keep it to questions, not statements, please. Hi, uh, my name is Fabrizio. I'm from Italy, and uh, I have a question regarding how the European Union can help national member states um, help their populations, especially the most uh, vulnerable, adapt to threats online. Because we can talk a lot about uh, legislation and how to regulate big companies, but how and should the European Union uh, enforce uh, and make their uh, member states create legislation to help vulnerable people adapt to uh, threats online? Because growing up, uh, and I think still today, I had no uh, way whatsoever of uh, learning how to protect myself from foreign interference uh, online. Uh, and I think that this is pretty much still the case today. Thank you for the question. And it is exactly what uh, I was starting to say about empowering. The reason why there is this regulation at the European level is that then the national countries don't need to take their own regulation, but they need to implement the means, the means to help on the direct implementation through all citizens. And there is this question about empowering users, meaning that everyone has to understand how the platform works. Um, everyone can uh, notice uh, illegal content and ask for feedback. This is within the regulation because today you could just uh, notice the content and then you will not have any answer. You don't know, sorry, you don't know what the platform will have done or not with that. There are some provisions also to help the governments with law enforcement. Um, I can tell you that even as a member of parliament, sometimes I could notice some very, very uh, uh, racist content, for example. And then the platforms will say, oh, um, I'm sorry, you have to send these very, very heavy procedures to the uh, United States and we know nothing's going to happen. So now they have an obligation of cooperation with uh, the, friend, the national authorities. And if they do not, it's up to 1% of the global income. Every time they do not answer to a notification from the states. So this is elements that are helping. I'm adding just the last one that is the trusted flaggers. There are a lot of NGOs working, helping everyday uh, people suffering for these abuses. Now they're gonna have the status of, of trusted flaggers. What does that mean? That means that when this NGO of 
I don't know, rights and justice makes a notification to a platform. The platform has to deal with that uh, in an urgent way and to answer to it very quickly. So this is all the means to help citizens to feel the benefits from these regulations. Oh, absolutely. I just had one program that we call Digital Decade in Europe uh, that uh, put uh, at disposal also the member state uh, a budget and uh, encourage the member state to invest on the digital education. And that is not something that we can impose. All these, all the things that we have heard so far, there are laws because when you, a regulation is a European law directly applicable in all the member states. So, I mean, everything you have, you have, you have heard so far, it will be uh, enforced in all the 27 member states. But there are education is something that uh, belongs to the competence of the of the state and sometimes of the of the regions. So what we want to encourage in the education program is digital education from the very primary school, and this is absolutely fundamental, especially to provide the most vulnerable people with some tools to defend themselves in their daily life. And the daily life, a good part of the daily life, is a digital daily life. So this is something that from here to twelve thirty. We hope we'll have seen some improvement in the European society. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry for those who had other questions, but maybe we'll have some time after to, to have a small chat together. Thank you so much. Thank you for such an incredibly uh, interesting conversation with uh, a lot for us to learn here uh, in the United States. Um, next, it's my privilege to welcome to the stage uh, Patrick Gaspard, uh, our fearless leader here at CAP uh, as president and CEO, and also FTC Commissioner Alvaro Bedoya for our second discussion. Alvaro is a leading expert on privacy and the deleterious impacts of technology on our civil liberties. He founded and directed the Center on Privacy and Technology at Georgetown Law School. Uh, where he also served as a professor of law. And prior to that, Alvaro served as the inaugural chief counsel to the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Privacy, Technology, and the Law, and as chief counsel to former Senator Al Franken when I had the privilege of working together with him. He is a naturalized immigrant born in Peru and holds a law degree from Yale and is an undergraduate from Harvard. Looking forward to this discussion. Thank you so very much, Ben. Uh, and thank you, Commissioner for joining us here at CAP today. Can we get a round of applause for Leticia and uh, our parliamentarian uh, from Europe? I think that was a, an exceptional conversation. Thank you so very much for your leadership. And I think that we're all enormously excited and proud that this is the inaugural event for Leticia uh, in uh, her role. Uh, so Commissioner, there is so much ground to cover on something that I really believe is the central most, one of the most central and urgent concerns uh, that we're faced with uh, at uh, this yet early part of the 21st century. Uh, this is certainly a transnational uh, challenge. So it's exciting that we had this conversation uh, and that President Biden and Secretary Blinken have taken uh, leadership uh, as a nation that hosts many of these uh, companies uh, in, yeah, uh, impressing uh, for uh, global attention uh, and, and, a, and a new global regulatory framework. But I want to bring this close to home. And by home, I mean your own home. I want to be a little personal here. Ben just mentioned uh, that you came uh, to the U.S. as an immigrant. Uh, I believe you arrived in 1987 uh, from uh, Peru uh, and studied here uh, in this country. Right. Uh, but I wonder, uh, when you think about this issue from the perspective of the journey that you have traveled from when you arrived in that America, uh, in that world, in that moment, uh, and now uh, you're the parent of two very, very little kids yes. uh, who are coming into a brave new world that we hardly have language uh, to describe, yet alone uh, regulations for. And I wonder how you're thinking about this, not just as a public servant, but a public servant who happens to have to be the steward for those two young minds. Thank you. And that is that is my first job. It, it, there's two sides. On the one hand, um, and I'm sorry, let me step back and say thank you for having me and thank you to Ben uh, uh, and thank you to uh, both of you for um, for being here and sharing this event uh, um, and putting it on. Um, when my family came here from uh, Peru, you know, this was a place of just total possibility for us uh, and you're in a very lucky position to have that. And I think one of the best parts about raising kids in the, in the U.S. is 
uh, um, I was uh, came with that immigrant mentality. You know, if I wasn't an engineer or a doctor, or a lawyer, uh, um, uh, I, I would have there would have been questions, let's say, uh, uh, for me from my family. But um, the United States is an extraordinary place. It's a place with uh, um, with a you know film industry, with an arts industry, with uh, it is a place where you can pursue a passion and, and you can actually say to a child, if you, uh, whatever it is you want to do, I will support you. And, and that's what I want to do for my children. And that is, uh, it's true in a few other places in the world, but but it's absolutely true here. And, and that's extraordinary. On the other hand, and this is true for my kids, it's true for kids growing up around the world, our online life is, um, is not straightforward. It's complicated. And I'll say to offer a little bit of context, I spent much of my career asking hard questions when someone was proposing a new government intervention online and saying that it was all being done in the name of safety. You know, and so I was, as as Ben mentioned, chief counsel of the privacy subcommittee when Edward Snowden's document started uh, uh, gracing the front pages, uh, started appearing on the front pages uh, uh, of, of the nation's newspapers. And I spent a lot of time at Georgetown uh, asking a lot of questions when police departments across the country were trying to say, yes, you know, we do need to enroll every single one of you in a face recognition database, and we do need to photograph you and track you at all times. And so I came to this question with a lot of skepticism. But as a commissioner and as a parent, I looked at the research and the research is there. The research is there to establish that there is a relationship between certain kinds of social media use and teen mental health. It's nuanced. It's not monolithic. There might be a two-way relationship between these things, but it is something we have to reckon with. And um, and so I was very glad to have the Surgeon General express uh, his concern and frankly uh, 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 validate as a medical professional that these concerns are real. And so, yeah, as a parent, uh, um, uh, that concerns me. And I spend a lot of time thinking uh, with both hats on uh, about how someone in my position can help. Uh, you know, thank you for making note of the Surgeon General's recommendations. I, I will tell you as a parent who feels as if my kids were part of the guinea pig generation for big tech, they're now uh, one just graduated university, the other is in college still. Uh, but uh, their formative years uh, were spent playing with these new tools uh, that we barely understood. And at some point, it became clear to all of us uh, that there was an addictive uh, nature uh, to the design uh, that was intended to uh, enable these companies to keep our kids on so they could feed them more advertisements. Right. Uh, and that was just kind of an endless loop. Right. I wonder if you could help us understand um, the FTC's historic role around these kinds of issues sure. uh, and how that responsibility has evolved sure. uh, in this moment to center on tech, given that this is an agency that was launched in 1914 and your particular right. mandate, uh, I think, has its origins uh, around consumer protection in the late 1930s. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So the FTC is founded in 1914 and Congress did something very smart and frankly, very rare when it founded our commission. Congress doing something smart is very rare. <laughs> As a former staffer, I object to that, but but it is rare for Congress to give a very broad grant of authority uh, uh, to a regulatory agency, at least as broad as the commissions has. Um, so we were given the authority to combat uh, unfair methods of competition, and in 1938, that was expanded to include unfair and deceptive trade practices. Congress looked at efforts to try to cabin those to specific industries, looked at those efforts in the eye and said, no, we will give a very broad authority. And they, you can look at the congressional record. They say, we don't want to spell this down to the letter. We want to give this commission uh, the ability to become expert in a problem and to address a lot of these problems in their incipiency. And um, what I'm really proud of about the commission is that the commission is a place that takes that expert role very seriously. And it periodically looks at it and says, okay, well, how can we be more expert? In 1954, there used to be a division of economics. It became a bureau of economics. So that now we have 80 PhD economists uh, uh, so that if a company comes in and makes certain claims about its market, makes certain claims about what consumers are experiencing, I can call up dozens and dozens of economists to say, how does that shake out? Is that right? Uh, and then in 2011, we appointed our first technology officer, chief technology officer. There were other amazing technologists before then. 
such that today, again, if a company comes in with a particular claim about how a technology works, I don't need to take their word for it, right? There are on-staff full-time experts who can check that math for us. And now I and, and others at the commission are uh, uh, recognizing that we need to update our expertise even more and ideally include psychologists and other mental health experts on our full-time staff. And let me give a very concrete example, if I may. I, I'm, oh, please, I, go I, ahead. No, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, no, no, is, I'm going this, on. No, 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 no. I want, I want you to, I'm, I'm going to, um, I want to just put a fine line please. on what you just said, yeah. because I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, in, you know, our leading economies, uh, you can count probably, I think on one hand, maybe one finger, uh, the uh, the number of governments uh, that actually have psychological expertise right. uh, in their trade commissions deal with these issues. Am I, am That's I right That's exactly about that? right. From, from everything we could tell from a quick social media poll, but also some research from staff at the commission, uh, we know there are folks at the UK who have uh, psychologists on staff in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, there's, there, there's some folks at CFPB. Uh, um, but in terms of regulators charged with consumer protection over the tech sector, I haven't found any in the United States as of yet. And so, uh, um, yeah, I, I, it's high time that we expand that expertise, in my view. Well, you know, you you have said, uh, you've expressed pretty uh, elegantly and powerfully in the past that uh, there's the old saying that we have here in Washington, D.C., those of us who follow uh, tech and the regulatory framework, that legislation always lags behind technology. But you right. said, yeah, and expertise right. lags behind both uh, technology right. uh, and legislation. So help us all to understand yeah. here at CAP, those who are watching, yeah. those who are following, not just uh, on Capitol Hill, but in their state capitals, yes. what we could all be doing to make sure that we lift up that kind of expertise uh, in uh, the regulatory ecosystem. There is this idea. This require appropriations? What, what, what's needed? It, it requires a couple of things. Um, I do think, as you said, there's this idea that once you pass a law regulating a thing, that that thing is addressed. But the reality is that oftentimes regulatory agency law enforcers do not have the staff who is expert in that in order to adequately enforce it. And so uh, uh, one thing that happened was our nation's philanthropies came together and said, well, wait a second, this is just a bunch of lawyers enforcing a law they don't fully understand uh, uh, when we passed a slew of privacy laws in the 90s and early 2000s. And so they built out a new career track called the Public Interest Technologist Career Track. And now uh, um, the FTC has had some luminaries, Latanya Sweeney, you know, Ed Felton, uh, um, many people in between uh, who helped us do that work. And, and so now what we're trying to do is, uh, uh, and, and under Chair Khan, we have added to our strategic plan to explore hiring on psychologists and other mental health uh, youth development experts as well onto the staff. And so uh, you need a couple of things. You need a pipeline. You need uh, students who are studying psychology, students who are, uh, uh, who are studying public health, medical students, uh, uh, nursing students to say, oh, wow, there's a role for me in policy, right? And, and there need to be people not just studying towards that, but there need to be actual jobs at these places for them to go. When they go, there can't just be one of them right? Uh, it's pretty lonely to be one. And so there needs to be a concerted effort to have uh, uh, multiple positions. And then uh, uh, there needs to be funding and a recognition that this is a new kind of expertise that will require additional funding. And let me say to this being a bipartisan issue, the idea to add psychologists to the commission was from a House GOP proposal led by Kathy, uh, 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 Representative Kathy McMorris Rogers, now Chair Kathy McMorris Rogers, and um, and so there's a couple of things that need to happen, both in terms of the educational, the education, uh, uh, the jobs, and then the funding. Uh, but I do think it's absolutely necessary. So as somebody who uh, worked on the establishment of Obamacare, I know how uh, a funny thing happens with GOP ideas uh, when <laughs> they come up for actual uh, debate in Congress. So we're going to get back uh, to that in a moment and this notion of bipartisanship around this issue, because yeah. I actually do want to ask you uh, a question about uh, the op-ed uh, that President Biden wrote uh, sure. for the Wall Street Journal a few weeks ago. But before we get to that, yeah. uh, and I know that I have to be kind of careful because you know we're, we're you you are a commissioner who's yes. adjudicating over actual cases. You don't need to be uh, careful. I need to be careful. There, there, yes. it, there it is. So I could be a little mischievous, right? So go. it's it's so it's impossible not to hear you say everything that you just said about expertise, the psychological um, difficulties, trauma right. in, in some cases uh, that our young people uh, are experiencing uh, online without thinking about uh, the whistleblower, Frances Hogan, uh, and her uh, Facebook documents that made it abundantly clear uh, 
uh, that there is a case that is understood by these companies themselves uh, about that harm. And just like big tobacco, they have all these studies that somehow end up being uh, buried somewhere. Uh, and I wonder, given the astonishing lack of transparency from these companies, sometimes outright deception uh, from them, how is it possible for you to regulate something that is incredibly opaque uh, and that our legislatures uh, really struggle to understand? Mm. So there's a lot to that question. Let me let me try to divide it up into issues around what the research shows. And uh, um, I, I won't talk about the expertise we need because I've already talked about that, but then how we hold companies accountable. So, uh, uh, and as you said, uh, I'm speaking for myself, I'm not speaking for the commission, uh, and I'm also not speaking about uh, those particular allegations or any particular company, not just because that's what I'm supposed to do, but that's what the research shows. We have eight to nine years of peer-reviewed scientific research in our nation's top and the world's top psychological journals uh, um, establishing that certain uses of social media impact mood and eating disorders in children. Now, uh, um, much of this predates those allegations. Uh, much of this predates the documents that, were, that you referred to. Uh, that research is not confined to one company. And, uh, and I want to be fair because I, I don't want there to be a headline that says Commissioner Bodoya declares that, that social media should be banned. Or oh, we're trying to get headlines for cat. Uh, 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 well, you can get those headlines. Help us out a little here. I, I need accuracy. Uh, um, it all depends on how you measure it, yeah. right? And so if you're measuring all social media and you lump in sc screen time, right, you're going to get one outcome. If you look at all young people and, and include, you know, people of all genders, you're going to get one outcome. If you differentiate by gender, you're going to get a different outcome. If you look before 2010, you're going to get one answer. If you look at after 2010, 2012, you're going to get a different answer. And so this isn't this yes, no, good, bad uh, type of a research finding. What it is, it's enough for me to say there's a there there. It's enough for the Surgeon General of the United States to say there's a there there and the nation's leading psychologist to say the same. And so uh, uh, this is a broad problem. Uh, uh, and then the question is, what the heck can we do about it? Um, one thing I want to push back on strongly is this idea that we can't do anything because of Section 230, all right? And that there is no law here. Those are two things I hear that are just flatly incorrect. Um, and, and you'll cut me off. If no, I start, you, you, if understood, I start... you understood my question without okay, me even saying Section okay, okay, 230. Okay, okay, okay. So, um, let me recommend everyone an extraordinary study by the Five Routes Foundation in the UK. And uh, the great thing about the study is they interviewed engineers, they interviewed kids, they interviewed teenagers about how they use social media. And if you read that and, and many other expert reports and studies, social media is not one thing, it's many things. And the alleged harms of social media uh, stem from different aspects of that technology. And so, yes, there are very serious allegations around content recommendation algorithms right? Uh, uh, and I'm not going to opine on Section 230 and what it says either way on content algorithms. All I want, and nor do I want to deprioritize that question because it's an important question. But what I do want to say is that there are other alleged drivers of mental health issues online. One of them, for example, are architectural and design decisions that encourage young people to get online and stay online. That uh, These are design decisions that again, uh, per this report, allegedly play on a lot of psychological vulnerabilities that young people and adults have. Intermittent variable reward, infinite scroll, video autoplay, scarcity, uh, 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 content that'll just disappear after a certain amount of time. And, um, and these are content agnostic design decisions, right? They operate completely separately of what the content says. And uh, uh, I think that these are the kind of design and architectural decisions that Section 230 historically does not uh, 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 does not speak to. Lastly, there are, there's also structural decisions around privacy defaults. And so we brought this big case, uh, we settled this big case, and, and, and by we, all the credit needs to go to the D Division of Privacy and Identity Protection and, uh, and DAP, I believe it was, that uh, the Division of Advertising Practices that filed the 
different financial practices. Thank you. Um, massive settlement. I'm impressed with your ability to manage the acronym. Thank you. Uh, uh, over half a billion dollars to consumers. A lot of focus on the privacy uh, data collection issues. We brought an unfairness claim uh, uh, because Fortnite had allowed, by default, direct audio communications between unknown adults and children and teens. And you can literally go to the FTC website right now, and at least two days ago, the last time I checked, the top comment is from a parent who says, yeah, my 13-year-old is on Fortnite. Someone just told him to go kill himself, right? And so that is also a driver of mental health harms. And so... Uh, um, and by the way, you know, I, I, there are also speech concerns here, you know, with respect to content. Uh, uh, and there's also, you know, concern from uh, advocates, experts whom I trust and admire saying, hey, if you start taking down content, the content they're going to take down is going to be content that would be very helpful, you know, to gay, trans and queer kids. It's going to be very helpful to people making hard reproductive decisions. And so uh, I, I'm not saying anything either way on this, but I do want to point out that there is a broad realm of other issues that law enforcement and regulators can tackle, uh, uh, um, whether or not they decide to to confront these two thirty questions. That uh, that was incredibly comprehensive. You really uh, covered the entire waterfront there. But since you touched on uh, this question of um, uh, progressive rights, right. uh, you you mentioned um, what's happened, uh, of course, online with LGBTQ LGBTQ right. youth. Uh, and certainly women following the Dobbs decision. Let's sit on Dobbs right now and uh, an action uh, that um, the FTC took last week uh, against uh, GoodRx, right. uh, which uh, had been sharing privacy data uh, with uh, Google, uh, Facebook, uh, and other uh, third parties. Uh, and you, you know, you're, you're working aggressively now to rein that in. I hope you can just speak to us about how that might be a, a template for other actions and what implications right. that may have at the state level, particularly as we uh, consider the implications. Check, check. Okay. And what that, uh, what this could ultimately mean for yeah. women who are making some incredibly difficult uh, decisions uh, at an, in an era when uh, all of our health, health data uh, seems to be networked. I'm glad you asked about GoodRx. This is a really important case brought by our Division of Privacy and, and Identity Protection. And, um, you know, uh, long and short of it, this was a website that um, that promised discounts to people. And then when it, once it got very particular information about specific symptoms from a range of very sensitive issues, uh, including sexually transmitted diseases, erectile dysfunction, a number of uh, uh, sensitive conditions, was transmitting this information, uh, uh, we allege in the complaint that we settled, uh, automatically for marketing purposes with uh, 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 Google, Facebook, uh, uh, and I believe there was another entity there. And um, what are some takeaways? The first is this commission from Chair Khan uh, 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 to uh, all of my fellow commissioners, uh, Republican and Democrat, to uh, uh, Director Samuel Levine, to the Division of Identity, Privacy and Identity Protection. We are uh, uh, committed to protecting Americans' sensitive information. And if you are a company that's playing fast and loose with that information, uh, uh, we will be very interested in that behavior. GoodRx constituted the first time we brought a, a, a claim under the health breach notification rule, um, but it also included an unfairness count saying that we thought there was a very high likelihood of substantial injury as a result of this, all this detailed, personally identified information being sold, sent for marketing purposes to these websites. But I want to point out, it's not just GoodRx, right? Because we also filed a case against Cochaba that's currently in federal court for sharing sensitive geolocation information about Americans uh, um, uh, with uh, third parties. And again, in Fortnite, we brought an unfairness claim uh, 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 around these communications between adults and children. And for me, what that says is we are looking at every single tool in our arsenal, and we are going to try to protect people's sensitive data, and we're going to pr uh, try to protect uh, vulnerable people in this country, starting with kids, for example, uh, in the Fortnite settlement. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, thank you for those actions and for and for that thoughtful response. You know, you have um, used the word bipartisan not once but twice uh, in this conversation. 
uh, you know, fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray that we could actually reach uh, some bipartisan agreement on uh, some of these issues. Uh, but uh, all Americans know um, that regrettably, uh, there are some profound cleavages that exist uh, in uh, our Congress. And I wonder, based on your confirmation experience uh, and your experience now working with Republican commissioners uh, in the FTC, where uh, and whether you see uh, any appetite, any real momentum for a bipartisan uh, collective action on these privacy uh, issues, on competition uh, issues, and this question of uh, algorithmic design? I very much do. And um, it's everywhere you look. If you look at uh, Congress, I see uh, uh, we have staff from Senator Blumenthal's office here, which is leading a bill, a bipartisan bill uh, on kids' mental health online. And um, let's talk about the commission. I mentioned Kachava. That was a bipartisan vote. Uh, it was uh, uh, Commissioner Wilson uh, uh, voted in favor of that. The idea to have psychologists, mental health experts, um, that was a House GOP idea that we um, uh, that I've embraced. I think that um, there's a diversity of opinion on uh, on the rules that should apply to to adults, you know, but but, I think there is deep concern and well-founded deep concern among everyone, Republican, Democrat, in the middle, in between, that our kids should have a fair shot uh, uh, at uh, a healthy childhood and uh, uh, a healthy shot at, uh, at, at healthy adolescence, um, to use a very convoluted sentence. Uh, but I do, I, I do think there's a chance, uh, not just in terms of legislation, but also in terms of law enforcement and regulation. So I'm, I'm optimistic. We're going to ride the wave of your optimism. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to ask you one last question before we open this up uh, for uh, the audience. Uh, we have a you know, leading expert, one of the leading political figures in Europe uh, who just had a fantastic conversation here uh, about uh, DSA and DMA. Uh, and I wonder, uh, as you look across uh, the pond, yeah. um, uh, and in particular, since you cited um, the study from the UK, yeah. uh, if, you, if, we, if you think very specifically about lessons that you want to draw from any part of Europe, perhaps it's the, the UK, and uh, lessons from any part of the US, uh, yeah. I wonder where you would focus uh, our attention. Sure. I've heard you speak uh, with some real passion about uh, some of the things that have happened in California, and I right. wonder if you may unpack any of that right now. The UK Age Appropriate Design Code is uh, is an historic piece of legislation, and um, I'll say a couple of things about that in the California uh, uh, law that followed it, but was not identical to it in some very important ways. The real value of the Age Appropriate Design Code, in my view, is this best interest of the child standard, because way too often, and I experienced this as a as a as a Senate staffer, uh, and now I see it as a regulator. The folks who are in charge of overseeing these industries find out about problems in them after they happen and after the harm is done. The power of that affirmative duty is that it pushes a company to look at the data it has and what it, it is seeing behind the curtain and puts a duty on them to act in the best interest of the child. And that is that is a powerful, remarkable, and important contribution to the law in this space and, and the United Kingdom deserves every bit of credit for that. Um, California is very interesting for two reasons. First of all, so much attention has been put on the, the debates around new legislation, which, uh, um, which is smart and good. Too little attention has been paid to the fact that nine out of the 10 top social media companies are headquartered in a state that now requires them as a matter of law uh, uh, to very soon prioritize the interest of children above financial interests uh, with respect to kids' mental health. And it goes even further than the UK law in one very important way. The UK law is administrated by the Information Commissioner's Office who's doing terrific work. Their mandate is data. And so uh, um, a lot of the rules in that age-appropriate design code have to do with, are you using data? And if you are, these are the rules that apply. California's law is very similar. But that best interest of the child requirement, I don't read it to be uh, to be tethered to privacy practices. 
And the definition of dark patterns and the prohibition of dark patterns, again, is not tethered to data collection, data sharing, et cetera. And so these are two very powerful laws. I'm sure there will be issues with both. There are issues uh, uh, with both that we need to resolve with respect to civil liberties. Those are important. We can't brush those aside. But um, but on the whole, I, I am, uh, based on the conversations we've had at the UKIC, I think they've been very positive to protecting kids. And um, my hope is that California is a similar impact. I'm really inspired by how you draw a distinction between what's fueled by data versus what's fueled by intentional uh, design. You're asking some really big questions about uh, these business models that we all need to be interrogating together and appreciate the examples that you just laid up here. Would love to be able to open this up to uh, Q&A from our audience, please. Is there a microphone? Uh, uh, please say your name, affiliation, and a uh, question, please. Oh, hi. Uh, Stephen Balkan with the Family Thanks. Online Safety Institute. Good Thanks to see Stephen. you, Commissioner. Um, at our recent conference that you spoke at, uh, we had an international panel of experts mostly from Europe, mm. talking about child's rights, mm. children's rights, and by the way, up to the age of 18, to both access information, but also to uh, put information out there, to, to sort of present themselves, as it were, to the world. Um, what we're seeing in the United States, however, is efforts to outright ban social media. The Utah bill, which until two days ago had a ban for under 16s, I understand that's now been taken out. Right. But there's still this notion of parental consent up until the age of 18. Mm. How do we square these ideas of total bans with the rights of minors? Thank you for that question. And let me be very clear. Uh, I am not up here saying we need to ban minors from social media. Uh, um, I don't think that's how we do things, you know, in this country in general. Uh, um, that said, what was very powerful for me about what uh, Surgeon General Vivek Murthy said is that you had our nation's top doctor saying the data is there to require us to act. And notice also he said personally, right? Personally, based on the data I've seen, I think 13 is too early. Uh, for me, what is refreshing about that is when you talk about this relationship between teen mental health and uh, um, and social media use, you know, you get some, uh, uh, again, you know, concerns I don't want to set aside, but good faith concerns about speech, about civil liberties. Uh, uh, but you also get kind of a look that says, oh, you know, really? Is it, it's just another moral panic. And have we had enough time to, to study this and see the effects of social media on children? And I think we've had enough time. You know, by my count, there's roughly eight or nine years of peer-reviewed scientific research on this relationship in the smartphone era. And, uh, um, and what I think is so powerful about Dr. Murthy's statement is you have someone who is not uh, 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 into hyperbole, someone who is a sober, uh, uh, um, serious public servant saying, I have looked at the data and it is enough for him to say what he did. And so that sends a signal to me uh, and my staff that that this is extremely serious. And so, uh, um, and, and, and I respect what he said, I, 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 but I don't interpret the commission to have the power to, you know, by fiat say, we thereby ban X and Y and Z. That's, that's more for Congress to say rather than a, a commissioner like myself. But, um, but I think the, the, the hidden story of his remarks is, is that the data is there. Uh, it's nuanced, not monolithic, but it is there. All right, and we have an online question. Um, as regulations try to catch up, what advice do you have for parents in the short term, things to look out for, best practices, et cetera? My, uh, my sister-in-law recently texted my wife and I was saying, hey, Alvaro, can you, can you come down to, to my niece's school and talk to the parents about social media? Uh, um, and, and I said, I have to check with my ethics office, but, uh, but if they allow me, then I'd be glad to. Uh, this is a really, really hard question. and. Um, and to be completely candid with you, I, I, I'm spending a lot of time thinking about it, but I do, I, I do think there's one thing that I want to communicate to parents, uh, uh, which is your interests and your child's interests uh, do not necessarily align with those of social media companies, right? These are publicly traded companies. They have certain obligations to their investors. 
as to uh, making money, putting up profits, et cetera. Uh, uh, your obligations as a parent obviously are quite different than that. And everyone needs to understand that historically we have not had that legal binding obligation to take the best interests of a child into account in making these design decisions. That's a new thing we have. And so I think if I could say one thing to parents, it is that, I'll say two things, uh, is that your interests do not necessarily align. And so you need to be skeptical. And then the other thing I would say is pay attention to the time your child or teenager spends online, right? Uh, um, one trend, right? So I said, it's not monolithic, it's nuanced. One trend you see, there's like a 2015 study on this, 2018, 2019, 2022, et cetera, uh, cross-sectional and longitudinal showing that when a child, particularly teenage girls, are using social media for three hours or more and then increase from there, there are strong relationships with that kind of use and clinical depression, clinical anxiety, suicidal ideation, thoughts of self-harm. And so I would monitor the amount of time your child spends on social media. Uh, uh, certainly that's what I hope to do. Uh, uh, and, and just keep in mind as, as, as a base set that, that your interests may not align. Do you know, Commissioner, I appreciate everything that you're saying. And I appreciate just how sober uh, and tempered uh, the Surgeon General was uh, in, in making his, um, his, his pronouncement. But you know, we seem to be putting a tremendous amount of onus on parents uh, at yes, a time when practically every classroom in America is using this t these technologies to right. uh, in their curriculum, right? right. I, I there there are so many young people in my uh, in my family who I know get these assignments from teachers where their where their ten year old has to go on YouTube to look up uh, a particular uh, video and then report out on it. Right. Uh, and we know that that is one of the most pernicious uh, spaces that exists uh, on the internet. And it's also the case, it's also right. the case that increasingly uh, our TVs behave uh, in the ways uh, that our portable screens do, right? In the way that we're making decisions about the next thing we're watching, right. the next thing right. we're watching. And so I, I, I just wonder if this is not rather unfair and we're putting a it's tremendous amount unfair. of pressure That's and right. burden uh, on on parents uh, and what your thoughts are on that and yeah. then given that you had a life before you became a commissioner uh, and you would spend a lot of time on things like Ashcroft versus Iqbal and the and the consequences of it how are you thinking about the role of litigation in the states uh, uh, by yeah. private uh, citizens against some of uh, these actors it's tremendously unfair to parents I come from uh, the world of privacy law and policy and, and you see this in privacy, you know, uh, uh, companies will do whatever they want. And then when you say, Hey, what, what'd you do? They say, Oh, well you click that box, you know, oh, we let you know, look at our terms of service. And, and there is now a broad recognition that notice and choice is, is uh, alone is a failure. And, uh, and in that same way, it is tremendously unfair to put on parents on top of taking care of their kids, making rent, putting food on the table to say, oh, and also you need to look at the social science literature around teen mental health and make your own decisions about how to, how to protect your kids. It's, it's tremendously unfair. And so uh, um, my hope is that a decade from now, you have uh, um, robust enforcement of the California standard, that the best interest of the child standard uh, uh, passes elsewhere in the country, uh, uh, whether it be at the federal level through uh, a legislation like COSA uh, or, um, or state legislation. Um, I, I do think we need to have uh, uh, serious conversations about how to make sure that we don't infringe on civil liberties and, and protect kids and teens' abilities to, to live their lives and have access to information about uh, um, that they need to, to uh, 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 to be healthy and and um, and uh, but um, that's the that's the law, right? Uh, uh, we also should have a set of guidelines uh, uh, for parents that they can turn to and resources that they can turn to right now that do not take long to access. I'll give you one quick example: if your identity is stolen or you get a you know spam phone call, uh, we now at the commission have a dedicated website. Identity theft, right? Uh, uh, get help, right? You'll immediately be served with one of these web pages that tells you, okay, here's what's wrong. Here's what you got to do. Reporter here, or go to your state attorney general site, do this. We need resources like that um, at the federal level. And so, in the next coming months, we'll be we'll be talking with um, the uh, uh, um, with uh, other executive agencies, uh, the White House, to to explore how uh, um, how we can bring those kinds of resources 
forward. And, and I don't know if that's the commission. I don't know if it's someone like the Surgeon General, but I do think we need better, easier access to resource uh, resources that, that boil all that down for parents to use. I, I was really honored to be able to participate last year in the national summit uh, that President Biden organized uh, in, the, in the White House on online hate uh, and that challenge and the solutions to it. It feels as if we need a national summit um, soon uh, on uh, child safety uh, on the internet. The president is, of course, giving a little speech uh, in the next uh, few days. And I wonder if um, there are, there's anything that we might expect uh, from the president of the United States in the State of the Union address uh, on uh, these issues, if you have a little bit of a preview <laughs> for us here. Uh, uh, um, I, I don't have a crystal ball uh, into that, but I will say that what I've seen from the president is very real. This is a very real concern uh, and a consistent priority for him. Uh, and um, and look, there's already been excellent action on this. Uh, there was a Center for Excellence on Social Media and Teen Mental Health that was established. Um, and uh, uh, and Congress, uh, uh, um, uh, Senator Markey, Senator Blunt just passed a um, a bill that will provide $15 million of funding in one year alone on this issue. And so I ex I, I would expect more of that. And um, and I think that's something that's that's very positive. Uh, uh, but I would expect more of that. Commissioner, we have time for one last uh, audience question. Hello. OK, there we go. Uh, we've got another online question. Um, what might the FTC do to promote the safety by design best practices you outlined for consumer protection and child safety online? Can I can I make this a twofer? Yeah, please. So so we'll as you take that question, I'm I'm also going to misbehave with just a just a little bit, Commissioner, sure, to please. say you know I I just wonder when you're dealing with um, you know mega gazillionaire CEOs of companies like oh I don't know oh, right. Twitter uh, <laughs> that. Uh, seem exactly. to have a constitutional uh, aversion to any kind of uh, regulator, uh, how you uh, uh, manage in uh, this environment as well when they use their own platform uh, as, a, as a weapon uh, against, um, against norms uh, and certainly uh, against uh, the, uh, the constitutional framework that you operate under. To so the online question, um, we're bringing enforcement actions on this. We settled a half a billion dollar settlement with Fortnite because of how they structured their platform, because of how they treated kids' data, and because of how they allowed unknown adults to freely literally speak in the ear of kids and teens uh, in a way that, that we allege was very harmful for their mental health. And so uh, um, that, that is the staff's initiative. You know, that was not Commissioner Brewer going down and saying uh, uh, um, X or Y or Z. That, this is in the staff's uh, 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 um, minds as a top priority. Uh, it's in mine as well, but this is this is really staff driven. Um, and to your question, uh, not speaking about any particular CEO because that's uh, uh, inappropriate for me to do so in this context, I would urge every CEO uh, uh, of uh, uh, a tech or other company that is dealing with people's information to read a recent settlement uh, that we reached with Drizzly. Uh, in that settlement, we put binding obligations on the CEO with respect to privacy for not just that CEO's job at Drizzly, but at any other company the CEO would go on to work at. This commission, uh, uh, under uh, 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 leadership of Chair Khan, is also, and Commissioner Slaughter, has also pressed aggressively to make sure we name more CEOs individually in our complaints and in our actions. And so, uh, um, you know, one thing you learn in law enforcement is that sometimes you're not able to have a pithy response publicly to everything that comes across, you know, uh, um, your screen uh, uh, or, or your newspaper. But I think every CEO that is playing fast and loose with data should read that settlement with Drizzly very closely. You may not consider yourself pithy or glib on uh, these issues, but you're <laughs> extraordinarily thoughtful uh, and eloquent and, I dare say, courageous. Can we thank the commissioner? Thank you. So we really appreciate uh, having you today. We appreciate your leadership. We appreciate all that Chair Khan's doing. What a fascinating discussion we had earlier. 
uh, with our colleague uh, from Europe and our uh, minister uh, in the European uh, Parliament to learn so much of what's happening around DSA uh, and DMA. We're taking up lessons uh, from that. Uh, and certainly applying them here uh, where appropriate and hopefully uh, in a collaborative uh, fashion. There is so much to do on this issue. Today, we hope to not just unpack the challenges, but to give you a sense of what some of the prescriptions are. We did a bit of that. There is so, uh, there's a long path uh, to travel here, but we hope that you will uh, stick uh, with the Center for American Progress as we continue to interrogate these questions. And sometime down the road, Commissioner, would love to have you and maybe even a Republican commissioner uh, in conversation with us in the future. Thank you for everything. That. Thank you very much. Thank you.